Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Dean Detlef. And I'm your other co-host, Matt Bernico. This week on the show, finally, you can hear from someone besides the two of us. After long last, a dry spell of no guests, we have a guest, and it's a doozy of a guest. Uh, Andrew Krinks is on the show to talk about a new book that you will definitely want to check out. It's called White Property, Black Trespass, Racial Capitalism, and the Religious Function of Mass Criminalization. A lot of big words that will all make sense to you in an hour from now, if they don't already, uh, from New York University Press. And it's great. It's really fun. Lots of cool stuff that we talk about on the show. A lot, I think, has some uh, resonance with what Andrew's doing in the book. And uh, I think it's it's great, too, to see some cool stuff coming out about abolition and religion these days. It's been a while since we talked about it here, too. So nice to get back in the swing of it. Yeah, for sure. Abolition is not a thing that happened in 2021 and then everyone forgot about it. It's still, <laughs> it still exists. Uh, and it's great. Probably more important than ever, honestly. Yeah, uh, this book is super rad. I really like it a lot. Um, something I really like about abolition, like reading sort of like abolition theory stuff is just that like, it's just the recognition that, you know, like all of the worst things in the world, like cops and prisons and like really oppressive types of Christianity turns out they're all kind of related in this <laughs> awful way. And, uh, if you really want to understand them, you have to kind of take them all together. And that's something that Andrew does in this book is, uh, he puts them kind of in context with one another and explains those connections. So if you are a person who values understanding the connections between these awful things in the world, this book is for you. What a weird pitch. <laughs> if you like, if you like, <laughs> if you like understanding bad things, this, this is a book that you can read. It's true. Although, uh, the other part of abolitionism that I really like is that, on the one hand, it is true. It's all about understanding the huge bummers that make up our world, a world of big bummers. But what else is great about it is uh, it's always a conversation that ends on a, a kind of invitation to do something different, create something new, and which I think is different than selling like a really cheap form of hope of being like, oh, maybe things will get better, or you know, the arc of history, you just kind of got to wait it out. Like, there's something really tangible and practical about the the deep faith of abolitionism to say, what if we did do it different though? And uh, Andrew gives us some really good pointers toward that. I also like that Andrew is not only a boring academic, um, not to say that he is a boring academic, but just to say that he's not only a scholar, he's also somebody thinking about this in, in terms of uh, organizing and actually getting stuff done. And you can see that, I think, both in the research and in the interview and really appreciate people kind of being willing to like get their hands dirty and especially theologians. Don't listen to a theologian tell you anything about politics if they can't tell you about what's going on around them and andrew definitely can i think that is really special and unique it certainly is let's go to the interview welcome to the show andrew it's great to have you uh we met a long time ago at a political theology network uh, conference. I think you were presenting even part of this book at the time, and I remember thinking it was so cool and very interesting research and uh, really nice to see it kind of come to fruition, and it's nice to be able to talk to you today. Uh, whenever we have somebody on the show, we ask them to give a, an elevator pitch for their book, and as we say, the elevator can be as long or as short as you are comfortable riding in it with us with <laughs> i don't know how to in that sense you get what i mean uh so how would you describe this book white property black trespass yeah well i don't love long long elevator rides so i'll try to make it as short as i can but um yeah the book white property black trespass um i think if i can whittle it down to uh the most concise form it's really it's an attempt to better understand uh why we have police and prisons in the sense of understanding what they're for, what function they fulfill, who they serve, um, who they don't. And obviously a lot of people have written about this at length. Increasingly, people are writing about this at length in our time, which is exciting. Uh, and I have benefited from a great deal of that scholarship. I think that my contribution uh, is to show that if we want to fully understand why we have police and prisons, we have to also grasp their fundamental relation, first of all, to whiteness and property. Uh, and second, that we need to discern the overall function and purpose of police and prisons in terms of religion, so that they serve a religious function. And I can speak more to that uh, in a moment, but I write this as a, you know, I wrote it as a, as a scholar, certainly, of religion and theology and carceral studies, but 
but also as someone whose um, work is as an educator and organizer. And so I hope that it's, uh, you know, my intention is for it to be clarifying intellectually, uh, but to be clarifying intellectually in ways that hopefully enhance our capacities to arrange the world differently. Um, so that's the that's the, the big overview. We can get into the weeds more. Cool. Yeah, that's that's a three or four story elevator ride, maybe. But I'll press all of the buttons and take us all the way to the top of this building. <laughs> I don't know why this is suddenly the controlling um, metaphor for this podcast, but I guess it is now. Um, tell us more about abolition and like why that's particularly interesting to you. Um, you, you mentioned sort of activism and organizing. Um, is that kind of how you got to abolition or is there something else? I, I, I attempted to take the opportunity to kind of reflect on this question in the preface to the book, which uh, is where I kind of narrate some of my upbringing. Um, uh, I had a reviewer in the process of the kind of editorial process of, of, the, of the book coming together who encouraged me to say more who I am at some point in the, in the book. So I took it as an opportunity to kind of reflect on these strands of thought I've been thinking about for a while in relation to my own my own story. And so what I narrate there is that, you know, I I am white uh, uh, cis man. I grew up in a Christian household in semi-rural suburban uh, southern New Jersey outside of Philadelphia, and in a Christian household, going to church three days a week at least. Um, but also, you know, there's a carceral element to my worldview as a child in that um, I was enthralled like many kids in the 80s and, you know, still today, I guess, uh, with uh, soldiers and police. And um, there's a picture of me as a kid, probably a few of them actually, of like all decked out in like plastic riot police gear and uh, army gear, uh, some of which was real that we got from a family friend who was in the military, not not guns, but you know, flashlights and bags and cool stuff like that. Um, and so I kind of feel like uh, the the sense of fear that I had as a child, somewhat of an anxious child, was related to or found expression in couple of forms and two that I try to link together one is fear of hell um so growing up in a a, a, a strand of evangelical uh white Christianity fear of hell was ever present um but also fear of like the world outside my safe little bubble um we would regularly watch the local news out of Philadelphia as a kid and anyone who knows about U.S. news in the 80s and 90s knows that it's a lot of uh, black faces made to be seen as um, the threat that's out to get those of us who are safe at home, um, particularly those of us who are white. And so um, I think my journey has been one of unlearning those inheritances that are partly political, partly religious in nature. Um, I kind of came, uh, became conscious politically around the time of the war in Iraq, uh, which is a whole other story, but it was an existential crisis of faith and of politics all, all wrapped into one. Uh, but by the time I was in and then out of college, um, I found myself proximate to folks who were experiencing uh, police harassment regularly, first through um, relationship with folks uh, experiencing uh, homelessness in Nashville. Um, I was the editor of a street newspaper and was regular hearing, regularly hearing stories from folks about how they were yesterday trying to sleep or stand or walk or use the bathroom or eat or basically just exist in public and how police were constantly coming up to them, telling them to move along, um, that they couldn't be there, that they were going to go to jail if they didn't, etc. And then simultaneously, um, I was invited by some former professors of mine into, into prison, uh, both the men's and, and women's prisons here in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live, uh, where I was able to, yeah, form relationships that were new to me, which was relationships with folks um, who had experienced criminalization to the point of incarceration. Um, 
and those relationships were transformative in many ways, including that, uh, you know, the stereotypes that I grew up with that I alluded to earlier about the kind of monstrous immoral threats of people who find themselves in a cage um, does not, you know, uh, always live up to uh, the stereotype. The reality is quite different in so many ways. And so while I was finding myself in those situations of relationship with criminalized peoples, I was also in divinity school and doing a PhD. And so I have this kind of simultaneous um, theological study in an academic level and also theological and political study via relationships and involvement in social movements, including, you know, related to, to homelessness and housing um, against criminalization of unhoused people, as well as um, the kind of the movements that emerged in 2013 and 14 against anti-Black police violence uh, and uh, for abolition. And so in the course of all of those kind of web of experiences, um, abolition kind of became a way of perceiving and relating to the world and others uh, politically and even spiritually uh, that kind of uh, became the clearest way that I could, uh, let me say how to say it, the, the, maybe the clearest way that I had available to me of making sense of the world that I live in in a way that orients towards justice and freedom. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, something I like about the book is that it is a very long book, a technical book, but not for the worse, uh, for the better. I think there's a lot of kind of moving parts to how we got here. As you said, it's kind of an ambitious task to narrate that. But that background that you do have um, in terms of social position and the theological education, I think makes the the length of it worth reading. There's a lot of unique insights there. And I think that you go out of your way to, to make it readable. So that is very helpful. And it's nice to have a, a chance to get into, as you said, the weeds a little bit here. And maybe we could start by just talking about the title of the book. You know, you make it clear, as you were just saying, that racialization, criminalization, property, these things are all intimately connected. And we'll add maybe the theological piece in a minute, not because it's like an appendix, but because this is probably a lot already. <laughs> so we'll build the, the, the edifice as we go. So maybe we'll just start here with, uh, you know, how are whiteness and property so closely linked together? And how is blackness also a, a, a related to trespass in light of all that? Yeah, so these are um, some, in many ways, complex things that I try to link together and, and show. Um, I'm not the first one to do so by any means, uh, but uh, I could speak in a moment to some of the touchstones that were kind of helpful for me in understanding these connections that are fundamental to what I'm trying to explore, which is connection between whiteness and property. Um, so uh, at the most basic level, uh, you know, what I've learned in my study over the years is that this consolidation of what is first Europeanness? Um, you know, I often like to ask students, um, you know, have there always been white people? And it's always a kind of confusing question because um, I think a lot of people are like, wait, well, yeah, but well, no, what do you mean? And it's like, you know, whiteness did not always exist. It it first comes into usage as a term white, um, arguably around the beginning of the seventeen or the 18th century, maybe late 17th century. And uh, around that time, a Europeanness or European identity um, was also also doubled as Christian identity, basically. Um, so in the context of colonial America, um, Christian and European were kind of interchangeable to some degree. And then whiteness kind of comes in and takes the term, becomes the term that encapsulates both of those to some extent. Um, but that process of Christian Europeanness becoming quote unquote whiteness, that's a process that actually takes place in and through and in great proximity to uh, the formation of private property in its most absolute and exclusive forms. So private property had existed for a long time, uh, but it was always, there was always this sense that, uh, or this kind of standard that even if one holds one's property as one's own, there's still some sense of responsibility to the well-being of others. Uh, but it's at the time of the formation of Europeanness into whiteness that private property also transforms 
from something that has relative, um, there's a sense of relative responsibility to others to there not being any responsibility to the well-being of others so that it, it becomes more resolutely and absolutely exclusive. So some of the touchstones for me in understanding these, the link between whiteness and property, uh, one is Cheryl Harris, a critical race theorist, had a classic essay, Whiteness is Property, that she published in 94. And it really gets at the legacies of whiteness and property as two legacies that can't be understood apart from one another. Uh, I also engage a lot with W.E.B. Du Bois in the book, who, whose concise definition of whiteness in his article, the Souls of White Folk, is so clarifying to me in so many ways. And he says um, that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever. Amen. And that forever and ever, amen, often gets left out of a lot of uh, scholars when they cite Du Bois. They just kind of cut it off at ownership of the earth. Um, but we can get more into the theological dimension, but I actually think that whole sentence is extremely important for understanding, um, you know, the scope of whiteness and property or whiteness as a possessive phenomenon. And then lastly, Willie Jennings, the contemporary theologian who um, says, among many other things, that whiteness comes into being in the form of a landscape. That's the way he puts it. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that Europeanness becomes whiteness at the same time that private property becomes absolutely exclusive private property in the same place and in the same time and, and often with the same groups of people, to me shows us that, you know, these are intimately connected phenomena. Um, that whiteness, you know, is always inherently, a, it's a possessive phenomenon. It kind of gets articulated as as such, uh, or it could whiteness, you know, becomes what it is in and through acts of possession, which is to say also acts of dispossession, you know, under a capitalist and colonial uh, arrangement. And we can talk more about enclosures in a moment too, the, you know, property uh, in its absolutely exclusive form is only possible if someone has been displaced from that property. Um, and so uh, I argue that, you know, a world in which whiteness is defined uh, as a capacity for private possession that others allegedly do not have that same capacity. Um, so in other words, a world in which whiteness and property are continuous with each other that's the same world in which blackness inevitably registers as a mode of trespass. Uh, so if the world is arranged according to um, so-called white people to have access to land in a way that others do not, um, then that inevitably, just like logistically, practically means that people who are not, who don't register as white are more susceptible to being discerned as people who are out of place, who are trespassing in a world made for, for whiteness. And then last thing I'll say about this trespass notion is that um, I find the term trespass the most useful one for doing what I'm trying to do in this book because it at once helps clarify this kind of landed or spatial dynamic of, of racialized possession. Um, you know, trespass law is an important component of property law. Uh, there is no property uh, without laws against trespass, uh, prohibiting people from crossing over into a t specific, you know, uh, lot or territory. Uh, and and also uh, this, the fact that trespass has this kind of religious resonance to it too, you know, and in one of the versions of the Lord's Prayer, um, uh, forgive us our trespasses, so forgive us, you know, our sins or our debts, you know, we can get into those three different versions and how they're related and different, but uh, trespass uh, in a lot of ways signifies a kind of a mode of, of immorality or simply of, of sin. Um, and both and kind of, it, it's like socio-spatial on the one hand and it's religious on the other. I think both of them, what they have in common is is a designation of people who are out of place, um, out of place geographically, especially out of place in terms of sacred hierarchy, um, 
uh, morality, authority, et cetera. And so uh, a world in which some land is marked out for white possession is a land that dispossesses a great number of people. And that is the an arrangement that necessitates a force uh, based on uh, allegedly legitimate violence to intervene and to put people back in their proper place. And that institution is police, simply, um, and police which feed people into prison. Um, so that is kind of the connection uh, between those phenomena. Yeah, so many good connections. Uh, abolitionism is such an interesting perspective in that it pulls out like really systemic links between these things that I don't think you'd recognize otherwise. Uh, well, just a minute ago, you mentioned another one of those links uh, being Christianity or some of that, uh, you know, the, the language about trespass and um, the, the the moral aspect of it all, which is really fascinating. And I think part of what draws us to your book in particular uh, on this podcast. So could you talk to us more about the the ways that you see Christianity as like a soil for that, that kind of like um, carceral state, you know, the ways that it, it works specifically kind of by a Christian logic? I know that's like a... That's a huge question, I guess. <laughs> but uh, maybe just could you name like a few of the carceral practices that you find in Christianity that you think are like overlooked or important for thinking about how we've gotten here generally? Absolutely. So, you know, the first thing to say is, as I think we all know and I imagine your listeners are very familiar with this idea that Christianity is far from being one monolithic thing. It's Christianities. There are, there are many traditions within the tradition or you could say many trajectories within a tradition, some that seem to oppose each other, some that are even you find in the same exact thinkers, like Augustine, for instance, who I engage. Um, I find that he is within traditions within the tradition that lend themselves to carcerality, but also certain aspects of his work lend themselves to the liberation, which is opposed to carcerality. So, uh, you know, one of the threads that I... Uh, spend time engaging in the book is uh, these threads that I call carceral or theocarceral thinking on sin and salvation. So soteriology, you know, is the, is the stuffy theological term for thinking about what sin and salvation are. And um, I'm thinking with, as I mentioned a moment ago, Augustine, but also Anselm and Calvin, those are three figures who are on this long historical trajectory. Um, and so some people may think, you know, those folks have lived a long time apart from one another. Why do you put them in such close, you know, why do you put them together to make sense of a trajectory? And I, you know, to me, there's a great deal of continuity between them. Um, and it actually is helpful to show how long of a trajectory, excuse me, that it is uh, across time. And so from the beginning, you know, in our, in sacred texts, you've got all kinds of ways of making sense of uh, ultimate realities, divine realities by way of very human and political things. So you've got judicial and legal conceptions of God and of um, the world in which God's people live, uh, a judge, a king, a lord, landowners, like all these kinds of images. So you kind of can't escape it from the get-go in terms of the sacred text origins of the tradition. Um, but then, you know, as time goes on, uh, you've got this kind of ongoing interaction between political and theological ways of understanding the world and of ultimate reality uh, that really are mutually informative throughout time. Um, so that by the medieval era, you actually have like judges and magistrates and theologians who are hanging out and talking and kind of informing one another's ways of understanding and even arranging social order and ecclesial order and all of that. Um, by the time you get to Luther, uh, you've got him describing the state in terms of God's hangmen. Uh, so there's all these ways of the you know cross-pollination of theological and political thinking. Um, but the thing that, the kind of, the, to get into the weed for a moment um, around the kind of this Christian soil out of which some of these carceral realities come, I locate um, this trajectory of theocarceral or carceral 
thinking around salvation and sin in Augustine and Anselm and Calvin and kind of to make it as brief as possible for them. And there's lots of nuance and difference between them, certainly. But what's what's continuous and um, aligned between them is this understanding broadly that sin is a state of corruption that leads to a refusal to be properly subject to a life-giving God. So sin, you know, is a kind of pride for Augustine. It's a turning in towards oneself and away from God, worshiping created things instead of the creator, etc. You also have Calvin, though, with these really interesting, or sorry, Augustine with these really interesting um, characterizations of, of what sin is in the confessions, particularly where he uh, tries to paint a picture of sin in terms of runaway slaves in one place and in terms of prisoners who refuse proper subjection in another. Um, he even uses this image of um, the clanking of my own chains, like deafen me to your voice or something to that effect. And so there's this already in Augustine in that early um, centuries of Christianity, you have this notion that to sin is to um, to be disordered away from God. Of course, the notion of disordered desire that we find in Augustine, but also that um, that it's it's a refusal to be subject in the same way that one refuses to be subject to a lord or a king um, or a sovereign of some kind in a political sense. And you know, for Augustine and Anselm and Calvin and much of the tradition. Uh, this God to whom one should be subject is one who gives life, you know, who loves, who is just, who provides, who keeps safe, etc. But nevertheless, uh, the problem is articulated subtly and explicitly at times in terms of this uh, refusal of subjection um, to a God figured in terms of the sovereign. And so um, if the problem of sin is the problem of refusing to be subject, of being in the proper place in a divine human hierarchy where God is God and humans are not, um, then the answer to that, uh, the remedy for that is salvation, which each of these thinkers, again, in their own ways, but very parallel and, and ultimately aligned, they think of salvation in terms of, of a return to proper life-giving subjection. Uh, being in their proper place in the divine human hierarchy so that God is God and they are not, and they can therefore be provided for and have what they need. Um, because, you know, if sin is pride and you go your own way, then that ultimately is not good for humans either. And so for these theologies, the idea is that to be in subjection to God is to be um, in an arrangement that gives you life. Um, but what I think happens particularly through... Um, what Tink Tinker calls Euro Christianity, the kind of European streams of Christianity, is that these notions of subjection to a sovereign um, as what salvation constitutes and its refusal to be subject to a sovereign, that's what sin is all about, that gets kind of transplanted onto um, political arrangements that ultimately uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, start to take the shape of carceral institutions, penitentiaries, uh, police power, et cetera, so that um, the problem of crime, uh, which is the problem of poor people, always from the beginning, um, in the context of England and beyond, where these institutions start, um, the problem of crime is the problem of people who are out of place in social hierarchy, which is always understood to be a, derived from divine hierarchy. You know, if the state is kind of doing God's work to some extent, even if uh, in distinct ways. So if that's the problem of crime, then the answer to crime is, uh, and to people who are criminal, which again, always always was a matter of, of poor or dispossessed peoples early on um, and still. Uh, the answer is a return to subjection, which is salvific, for the people who are so subjected, you know, salvation is a return to subjection. It's good for the people who are sub returned to subjection. That's the framing on the part of the state. But it's also salvific, I argue, and uh, for the state itself in that it is rid of the problem of disorderly, disobedient, rebellious people. Um, they're put back in their proper place. They labor. They create wealth for others. 
um, that's where they should be. And so, yeah, that's kind of, that's the main place I explore, like where carceral thinking uh, kind of finds its way in and through um, a trajectory of, of Christianity. Yeah, lots of uh, strands to pull together and, and tie together. And obviously you say a lot more in the book, um, but nice to have you kind of summarize it a little bit for us here. Uh, something that I was thinking as I was reading your book and that occurs to me now, just kind of listening to you talk, is uh, on that salvation piece and tying it to carcerality. You have a great, you have a lot of great little phrases in the book. I'll say that. Uh, one of them is save T, S-A-V-E-T-Y, as opposed to safety, to kind of highlight that there's this weird uh, connection between being saved and the feeling of being safe. And then that kind of works itself out in these social ways. And uh, something, as I said, I thought about reading that is there's a way that that works itself out in the rise of prisons and cops and so on. They kind of guarantee the the salvific order that's going on in society. But there's also all these ways that psychologically too, especially I think in evangelical kinds of Christianities, but not only many others as well, including my own in Roman Catholicism, where you sort of become the you're the cop in your head, you know, like you're you're kind of working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And there's lots of carceral logics that affect us spiritually too. And maybe I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but I wonder if you could maybe draw some of that together too, just uh, given that it's in your your background and has that come up for you at all, kind of parsing this out. Yeah, for sure. I like I narrated at the beginning and and in my preface to the book, you know, I grew up in a context in which hell was this ever present um object of of my fear uh and of the fear of the body of people that I was with like all week long basically uh in church. And so, yeah, I definitely think that the constant threat of separation ultimate final separation from god is um is hard to separate from separation in a carceral sense uh, people being closed off from um, society and you know as i talk about in the book and as plenty of other people write about this this uh resonance between hell and prison uh is one that permeates writing throughout history on theological writing about hell, hell is a kind of prison, but also res uh, permeates um, writing by people who have experienced criminalization and imprisonment when writing about their experience in terms of hell. So it kind of, it's all over. I mean, I, I continue to find it all the time when I'm write, reading um, different authors, particularly living ones or recently living ones about experiences of prison. Um, and so, yeah, I even... You know, there's this line that I pull out from Calvin where he talks about, um, you know, the process of salvation brings us to, quote, our ultimate goal of safety uh, in the sense of safety from the, the prospect of separation from God in an eternal sense. And so, um, yeah, I found myself at that safety um, rendering of S-A-V-E-T-Y, partly but as a way of trying to like get clear about the, just etymologically, like safety and salvation being, you know, a cut, you know, from the same tree uh, etymologically, uh, that salvation is a process whereby one is made safe, and safety. I think I'm kind of arguing in its more like contemporary political social register and you know, like in public safety and what. Um, governments will talk about when they talk about public safety that implicitly there's a kind of a salvific thing going on there because it's so ultimate uh you know it's so all-encompassing uh, and what i mean by that is like i think about 2020 through 2022 what happened in around you know after george floyd brianna taylor you've got this movement for uh, that that picks up on the work that abolitionists have been doing for decades, if not you know centuries, uh, in in the form of a call for defunding the police, and then what do we have? You have a couple of cities that take away some change from the police, some couch uh, coins, you know, in the couch cushions, um, 
which is to say very small amounts compared to the, the whole pot of money they have. And then you have this kind of uh, response, the pendulum swings back and police departments are getting funded more than they ever have been. Uh, and with much more money than they were just a couple of years ago. And so all this idea of police got defunded and now there's more crime, just completely a myth. Like police were hardly defunded and there's way more money in policing now. And um, I take that whole dynamic of that swing, that like vigilant defense of the institution of policing as evidence of the fact that it holds such an existential place in people's imaginations, like it, like a mythic level of importance there if you remove police from the picture you are literally like uh enabling the destruction of civilization itself so it kind of it holds such importance and that was part of what led me to thinking about the religious significance of police and prisons is that um you know people uh tend to see the work of police in sacred terms so much so that even asking questions about it is kind of like a um, a desecrating posture to take. Like, to, how dare you ask a question about the people who keep us safe, who are doing God's will by keeping us safe. Um, but if you start to understand that that's not really what's going on, then you can start to see things differently. But um, yeah, so this is my roundabout way of responding to the question that absolutely, I think that, um, you know, safety and salvation uh really are, need to be understood together more than they are uh, and that that's clarifying for us both theologically or spiritually like for those of us who are people of faith to understand like how does my own sense of what, how I understand salvation might it be wrapped up in any way with kind of carceral concepts um, but then on the other side how are how might people's understanding of the function and place of police and prisons in society be kind of innately or implicitly wrapped up with something as ultimate as salvation. Um, and etymologically, they're right there together. And I think theologically and politically, they're really right there together. And that's part of the work of the book is to try to show the connection between the two. Yeah. You, you know, the the ways that religion and cops and prisons and all of it, it's also it's so closely tied. It might be like a tempting thing to just be like, well, then the idea should just be to throw away religion altogether, get rid of it. Obviously, it's bad if it's bringing all these things on. But you make a really interesting argument that instead we should um, think about alternative religious practices and vocabularies that um, focus on different aspects and kind of create different, I don't know, mythological, theological stru uh, structures. So what are some of those alternatives that you find appealing? Um, and then how do you think that Christians can like participate in the generation of abolitionist forms of faith? Yeah, thanks for this question. My starting point for this is the just the historical fact that in the context of chattel slavery in the U.S., um, that was an institution that was at every turn justified and legitimated and lauded and praised and defended in and through Christian thinking. Um, Christian lawmakers, Christian ministers uh, are, uh, and obviously particularly, and uh, a white Christianity uh, defends and legitimates slavery as a Christian institution. And then somehow, miraculously, likewise, at the same exact time, you have Christianity as a means of uh, pursuing liberation um, on the part of people who are enslaved. And so if Christianity is both in the context of slavery, uh, then I think that it's inevitably the same, uh, and I find it to be true that Christianity is present both in the brick and mortar and thinking of carceral and police institutions, as well as in the the work of organizing to build a world beyond those institutions. So um, in my observation, religion and spirituality and, and Christianity in particular um, already are very present within movements for abolition today. Um, this movement, uh, the, the present day movement for abolition, which you know I track starting in the late 90s as the kind of the current iteration, arguably maybe the 70s with some Quakers and some others, but then really in the 90s with critical resistance and into the present. Um, while it's not at the forefront and it's not like the one version of the civil rights movement where it's like a very church minister based um, venture, 
it's different from that. But nevertheless, I think what I'm finding in talking to people in this movement is that even if people are not active uh, participants in, you know, uh, Christian communities, that they come from them and that their lineage of Christianity that they inherited is both a source of uh at some at times disdain but also a source of meaning making for them still in a lot of ways um one of the ways that i see this come out is just in the kind of the rituals and song uh and some of those kind of practical street level orientations um like in the context of protests so um you know just this past weekend i was at a gathering a convening of abolitionists talking about um the rise of militarized police training facilities so-called cop cities and there was a great deal of singing uh very like uh, uh soulful song um and you know you think about the the practice of die-ins in the street where people do this kind of embodied um ritual that recognizes state violence um and that honors the dead uh, and there are um, a number of leaders within abolitionist movement that um, yeah come from Christian traditions, even if they don't wear it on their sleeve. And so uh, I think it probably wouldn't be surprising to say that I think that the tradition within the tradition of Christianity that is most resonant with those types of folks is liberation traditions, liberation theology traditions, which really... Um, uh, are oriented around this idea that God wants all people to have what they need to thrive, that um, to know God is to do justice, as Gutierrez channeling Jeremiah says. Um, and you also, you know, have these visions within biblical texts themselves, uh, thinking about Micah 4, um, talking about how everybody will sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one will make them afraid. Um, also, you know, in the prophets and the Psalms of this vision of, of a God is one who wants and desires for all people to be treated with, uh, justly, meaning fairly, to have what they need to thrive and to not be trampled upon by people who are trying to make a profit off of them. Um, and so in that basic sense, I think abolition already, or, or I should say the other way, that Christianity and, and even, um, aspects of Jewish tradition as well, as well as other religious traditions already kind of contain the seeds of abolition within them insofar as they contain ultimate orienting visions of all people being well in some form or another. Um, and I understand abolition as being about that, not just removing prisons and police, but about all people having what they need to thrive so that police and prisons are made obsolete to some extent. Um, and that we learn to navigate harm and conflict in ways that are more life-serving. Um, but then on, on a one last thing I'll say about this kind of connection between abolition and religion uh, broadly is, you know, I've been kind of compelled recently reading some anthropologists of religion who who want to help bring us beyond understanding or reducing religion just to, you know, belief, to tenets of like, you know, faith that you um, give your assent to, that you uh, believe in intellectually, and rather that religion really is better understood as a kind of combination of belief and embodied practice, uh, whereby the things that we do together, whether it's singing together or uh, partaking of bread and wine together or engaging in some kind of other practice together, uh, prayer, etc., that those... Um, are not just manifestations of belief, but that they're means by which we mediate, meaning we make present something that's otherwise doesn't feel present to us, or we make material something that otherwise feels immaterial or distant from us, uh, namely the divine or God or God's love. It makes it like embodied and, and you can feel it. Um, and that's what religion does. And so likewise, I actually think that I've been trying to experiment with thinking, and I do in the conclusion a little bit of the book, thinking about, you know, could we think about abolition in a similar way in that you have this impossible, material, what many people would call naive, unrealistic vision of a world where there aren't police or prisons anymore, 
and where everybody has what they need. It seems so remote, so far from reality now that it seems like naive and otherworldly. Um, but can we understand the practices that comprise abolitionism, you know, organizing people to understand safety in different ways, meeting people's material needs, getting people together to learn how to respond to harm in different ways than just with violence and social control. Can we understand those things as practices that essentially mediate or make present for us this otherwise otherworldly reality um, to get kind of like glimpses of it and little um, uh, tastes of it in, in part, if not in full. And so at that kind of structural level, I've been experimenting with thinking about abolition as an expression of religion in the sense that it makes the intangible tangible for us um, in some way. The uh, community of abolitionist Jesus is uh, already among you, I guess. Uh, I think that's very helpful that, you know, we, we talk a lot on the show about the ambiguities in Christianity and just trying to appreciate those contradictions and kind of not resolve them and see Christianity as a site of struggle. And I think the way that you kind of pull in that abolitionist impulse to say it's about generation producing something uh, more than it is even about getting rid of something is such a, a helpful kind of piece of that and something that it seems like a lot of abolitionist theologians, many of whom we've talked to in the past on the show, have been kind of experimenting with, you know, like what's the... Uh, What's a form of Christianity without all this carcerality? And uh, it's it's good to kind of leave that as an open question and say, well, maybe it's also kind of being generated through the uh, the abolitionist movement itself. And I wonder if maybe that's something that we could kind of ask you about as we turn toward the end of the show here. You know, you mentioned already kind of tracking the abolitionist movement. And I think, I mean, maybe this is wrong. I don't know. I'm reading all this from Canada now, though, uh, just across the border. And it seems to me that you know abolition ha abolitionism had this big cultural moment. And as you said, it, it even had some kind of nominal gains, right? Like the defund the police thing became a thing such that even certain city budgets felt pressured at least to, uh, I don't know, comport themselves toward that movement one way or another, to put it politely, I guess. Um, but some of that public discourse seems to have been more muted. Um, and even on the other hand, the reaction is is stronger, right? Like you see President Joe Biden in these debates kind of insisting that he's the police candidate, et cetera. So as a scholar working on some of these issues and, and publishing, you know, there's lots of organizing and writing that happens when it's not in the news. Um, what do you kind of see going on? What do you think your book contributes to that conversation? And and how do we sort of continue to to build that movement in such a way that it's not a sort of, you know, something contingent on, on headlines and, and, uh, and, and open for that kind of liberal doubling down on carcerality? Yeah, it's a great question and one I definitely think about a lot. And you know, if, I suppose I'm a little bit biased in that I, I as a organizer, am still very plugged into abolitionist um, campaigns and organizing. So it's very much a live thing for me still. Um, at the same time, what I do definitely recognize is that a lot of the people who came out into the streets in 2020 um, are doing other stuff now. Um, they've maybe moved on in some ways. Maybe their mind is still changed in the way that it was then, or at least for those who came out for the first time to this type of thing um, in response to George Floyd and, and all the other state murders. Um, and so, yeah, certainly the ground has shifted. The the frames have shifted. The, language, the public discourse has shifted such that... Um, Abolition is not ever present in the way that it was seemingly for that brief window of time in 2020. Uh, but I perceive the, the seeds planted then to still be bearing fruit just in ways that maybe are less obvious. Um, for one thing, you know, and this is again, answering question as I see it kind of on the grounds and I could speak to the kind of scholarship level too, is that there's a, I feel like the, the 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 common sense has shifted ever so slightly. Um, and speaking in my own context here in Tennessee, whereas in years before 2020 and years past, uh, the police could not be questioned, um, could not ever, you couldn't say no to them when they asked for money or for a new toy or for anything. Um, and even if, you don't have people like yelling defund in unison like we did a couple of years ago. Um, the standard has shifted such that 
it's no longer a given, I think, for um, that police should just get whatever they want because there's a new a new understanding has been introduced and that hasn't gone away entirely, even if the momentum is not as strong as it felt in 2020. Um, and so I think there's also been a shift toward away from the kind of negative construal of a defund and more towards a like, what can we make instead type of thing. Um, so in my own city, there's been success around campaigns that are pushing for like youth safety and restorative justice initiatives that are carried out by people who are abolitionists, but who aren't wearing that on their sleeve, you know, putting it out front and center because um, they know that the conditions are such that um, to lead with that is to kind of set yourself up for failure. For failure, um, and then in terms of uh, you know scholarship around this, I I am aware of um, a number of different people in theological and religious scholarship who are writing and thinking about this. Um, uh, I know that both of you have to some extent as well, and uh, written and taught and whatnot about this. Uh, and so I think that we will continue to see uh, work published around the intersections of religion and abolition and theology and abolition in the years to come. Um, I think it's just kind of that delay of people who were, who um, were starting to get into it in 2019 and 20 and 21 and who are uh, going to bring us some really exciting new ways of thinking about these things in the years to come. And there also was a volume put out a year or two ago on spirituality and abolition that I had something in. And um, I think, yeah, I think there's more to come. Um, and it, one, one last thing I'll say maybe here is uh, a current project I'm working on um, is looking at um, how liberation uh, theologies and ethics have been present in Atlanta um, in the movement to stop Cop City there. Uh, I'm starting to get in touch with a couple of the folks there as I'm working on a, on a paper. Um, the ministers who were active uh, in being a thorn in the side of the city, along with other organizers who were not faith-based necessarily. Um, there was a great deal of actual Christian worship, Jewish ritual, like all kinds of religious ritual, spiritual practice that took place out in the Walani forest um, in the early stages of the movement to stop Cap City. Um, even uh, Tortuguita himself, who was killed by um, Georgia State Police in the forest, um, a forest defender, um, uh, their mother uh, referred to them as somebody who uh, knew God and had a relationship with the divine. And one interpretation of um, the family's uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, the kind of the report on the conditions of their death uh, was that they were in a like meditation position um, and were shot in in that and maybe possibly like in an act of a kind of prayer. Um, and so uh, I see it as being I see the cop city fight as one of the front lines of abolitionist organizing right now. And um, from my vantage point, there's been a great deal of uh, religious and, and Christian practice and, and practice among other traditions there as well that has been not just, um, you know, an addendum, but has been essential in a lot of ways. Maybe not for everybody, for, but for certainly for, for streams of that movement. So I expect more and um, hope to be part uh, of keeping that in the frame for people because you know, maybe it's will be my last thing I'll say here, uh, is that one of the main premises of the book for me, and, you know, this connects to my own premise of my organizing work too, is that part of why I think it's so important to understand criminalization and the work of police and prisons um, as defenders of whiteness and property. Um, part of what's so important, important about understanding them as religious phenomena uh as institutions that fulfill something that 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 reaches the the level of a kind of mythic existential religious function uh part of why it's so important to understand them in those terms is that like i said 
Um, if we don't understand them in those terms and we just intervene at the level of material and social and political conditions without attending to this depth dimension that they fulfill, then we won't be able to replace them uh, with something that also fulfills an alternate kind of um, existential and mythic and religious or spiritual um, significance. And so, in other words, if if mass criminalization is religious, then if abolition hopes to win the day, then it too needs to tap into people's ultimate sense of meaning making and and significance. Um, and so if we don't do that, I think we're going to going to take a lot longer than otherwise would. Yeah, cool. I think that's a good way to put it. Um, I like I like all of that. Though. That makes a lot of sense. Um, well, to run to the conversation, I guess I, I don't know. Uh, I, I was uh, maybe a note about like what was happening to me when I was reading your book. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, I guess. Um, so I was reading your book. I got it just a few days ago. I've been working through it. Very cool. But like, as I've been reading it, you know, and I'll check Twitter, or whatever, between <laughs> a few pages, uh, as my attention span is waning. Uh, like the news in the UK has been like really grim. Uh, in a bunch of cities across the UK, there have been like these awful far right like race riots or pogroms that have been targeting people of color and doing real harm and violence against them. Um, I don't know. I'm sure people have seen the news about that and probably don't need to say too much about it. Uh, but your book created some like really interesting contradictions or tensions as I'm like, I'm reading about like how cops are bad and um, carcerality is bad and I'm t totally agreeing. And then on the other hand, I'm seeing like these riots happen and there are not police there to stop them. <laughs> there's not, uh, there's not that, that car, there's not that carcerality like coming down on these people, which, um, you know, is an interesting observation in all of itself. But uh, I, I think something I've been noticing is that a lot of people even in the UK left have been calling for the use of state violence and incarceration against these right-wing forces in order to protect migrant communities and asylum seekers. And I don't think there's really necessarily a conflict in wanting safety for marginalized people in a, in a situation like that. That's, I'm not, this is not a gotcha moment, <laughs> but, but I am wondering if there's more of an abolitionist way to think through these like through this, the seeming necessity of the carceral state in these extreme kind of situations. I feel like that's something that always comes up with abolitionism is people are like, well, uh, of course, uh, police, cops, prisons are all kind of these oppressive apparatuses, but what about this situation <laughs> that I want to drum up here for you? So uh, in true in true fashion of somebody uh, creating a roadblock to abolitionism, what, um, yeah, what do you think about that? I guess, what's your, what's your process of like working through some of those tensions and uh, contradictions? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, and I think um, we have to always be asking these questions in relation to what is happening in real time. And so, yeah, I I have it has been horrifying to watch some of the scenes of um, these groups of white men, largely in um, the UK and different cities across the UK, kind of just uh, converging on uh, non-white people, um, Muslim people, uh, black people, uh, lots of different people. It, it truly terrifying. I, uh, went back last night, uh, and was thinking about Stuart Hall a little bit, who is this, um, black British figure who is really important in thinking about understanding white supremacy and policing in, in the UK context over, you know, he was writing 50 years ago and, and more recently. Um, uh, he's, of course, passed now. But um, so one of the things that he and some of his co-authors uh, talk about, you know, there's this phase in the 60s and 70s uh, and even earlier and later of these moral panics, so-called moral panics. Um, it takes up this image of the folk devil uh, that other anthropologists write about in the form of of um, non-white in many cases, but also some white youth uh, muggers. So, so kids and young people and uh, allegedly people of color who were, uh, you know, robbing people on the street. And so this creates this kind of racialized moral panic uh, that the British state played a, very much played a role in stoking those fears. And, you know, in many ways, it's the British state that is the that is the original one of the true like truly one of the originators of white supremacy, um, and uh, you know I write in the in the book we didn't talk about it as much but you know this phenomenon of of enclosure and I was thinking about that this morning um, 
one of the examples that I lift up in the book, uh, the enclosure, of course, being this history of the transformation of public property into private property into the hands of a few taken from many, and how that dispossesses people, sends them to cities where they are then exploited as wage laborers. Police pick them up, they go to penitentiaries. That kind of is a starting point of capitalism and the carceral state. But there's this one example of a of uh, this case of a village in England um, that, uh, as many villages did, were like common, so-called commoners who lived on common lands previously, resisted this imposition of enclosure. Um, and even so militantly that they would tear down the fences that enclosed properties um, in mass and they would celebrate and burn them and sing and there's a whole like ritual to it. And so there's this kid who is the nephew of a clergy member who then grows up become clergy himself and he writes this poem in the early 1800s i believe where he is just railing in these mythic and theological terms against these these loathsome immoral commoners who tore down the fences of an enclosure when he was a kid and he kind of recalls it and he does so in a way to kind of glorify once again the um the divine significance of enclosure as an expression of god's will and in the course of that he has this line where he talks about um, how they were kind of like these uh, these commoners who were lazy and left their shoemaking uh, projects like halfway done to go out into the fields and tear down fences. And he says that they were like kind of hopped up on Paynim poison, P-A-Y-N-I-M. And I had to look that up when I first read it. And it turns out that that is a term about um basically referring to heathen Muslim uh, people um, in the context of the early 1800s in England and across Europe. And so this this term, Paynim, comes to stand in for kind of anti-Europe and anti-Christ, according um, to uh, some thinkers. And so that's just an example to think about how uh, you have this dynamic that is propped up by the parliamentary system in the UK for centuries now, including, you know, within the bounds of, of, of uh, Great Britain and then beyond too through colonial ventures of racializing others um, in ways that have to do with uh, religion uh, implicitly and explicitly. And so I say all that to say, and it's a long way, roundabout way of saying that, like, when it comes to the prospect of the state stepping in to um to help out with this like that's essentially asking the same body that is one of the most um central actors in the creation of a world based around white supremacy and anti-muslim and anti-black and and all the rest um orientations to come in and be a help for the people that that state has for so long um oppressed and dispossessed and etc and so I've seen the videos of these cops who are just like, ah, I don't even know what to do. Like, um, and uh, I think part of the not knowing what to do, I think we should read in relation to this phrase that's been popular for centuries in the U.S., which is um, cops and clan hand in hand. And it's not to say that every cop in the UK is secretly wants to be out there attacking Muslims and others. That's not necessarily the case, but that institutionally and historically, those forces are of a piece together. Um, and so it's unsurprising that the state would wield its great capacities that it does in fact have to defend something or someone or some property that they're that they are refraining from doing so in this context. And so Therefore, I, I find hope in these, you know, this anti-fascist tradition of large groups of people being ready. Um, you know, I think of this phrase that is popularized in recent years of we keep us safe. There's so many examples in the U.S. context of communities coming together, communities that know that they're also targets in the eyes of the police state, um, who know that they can't call the police um, because if they do, we see what happens, you know, Sonia Massey most recently, so many others who are killed when they call upon the state for some degree of protection. And so the answer, if not the state, then what is is all of us together keeping each other safe, defending ourselves from outright attacks? Um, in my own city, Nashville, Tennessee, 
We have had actual literal Nazis walking through our streets in the last couple of months with large uh, swastika flags, um, yelling racial epithets at black children and others and Jewish people. And it's a whole thing. And so there's a lot of conversation here around like the police were just standing there watching it. Um, and it's not because the police who were standing there watching them agreed with everything that those Nazis were saying, but because the lineage of their institution is that they come from the same uh, forces that create a white supremacist fascist. And so um, I think you ultimately have to look elsewhere uh, for safety in the absence of a state that is prepared to actually offer it. So that's my take. I know that it's in the moment of of great threat and attack on people's well-being and safety and security that that may feel insufficient, but also like the evidence is also there that police are being insufficient. And so I think it makes sense to look elsewhere. Oh, yeah, thanks for that question. Andrew, uh, thanks. A complicated situation for sure, but I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense and is certainly the product of a lot of complicated thinking about it. And people should check out that complicated thinking in the book. Uh, you mentioned the enclosure stuff, which is something we really wanted to get to but didn't. Uh, so that's just a great teaser. You can find a lot of really cool stuff in this book about enclosures, in particular and primitive accumulation and racial capitalism, etc. And I encourage you to find it. I think uh, it's worth the price of admission for that section alone. That is the section I think you were presenting. And I was like, well, there's something going on. that's really interesting with this guy at this uh, Political Theology Network conference. The book is White Property, Black Trespass, Racial Capitalism, and the Religious Function of Mass Criminalization. Uh, you can go get it. You should go get it. It's from uh, New York. And any place that people can find you or what you're up to or anything else you want to plug here at the end, Andrew? Sure. I'm on, I'm on the complicated platform uh that i still call twitter uh i'm on blue sky elsewhere it could be found there you could search my name and find some other stuff about me ways to contact me on my website um, and i do want to plug for there is currently i don't know how long it lasts but there is currently a um, sale on the book it comes out august 20 but it's already available for pre-order the enter code nyuau30 nyuau30 it's 30% off, so that, that helps with shipping and stuff, at least. So, um, yeah, just a lot of gratitude to y'all for the uh, theological and political education you offer us, and really great to be in conversation with you. Thanks for listening to Magnificast. If you like what you're hearing, you support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Magnificast. You can get an invite to our cool Patreon-only Discord channel where we talk about things like the ins and outs of psychoanalysis and whether or not it's an appropriate therapeutic tool. It's probably not. <laughs> a really yeah a lot of freud talk a lot of anti-freud talk i think it's great um i like psychoanalysis as like a weird thing but i would not want anyone who is primarily about freud to be like <laughs> counseling me on anything okay anyways sorry I, I digress um get an invite be a part of the listener community and uh be a part of the podcast in a weird God, parasocial way what more could you ask for um nothing our intro music is by Amara Armstrong, our outro music is by The Logical Spoon, and we'll see you next time. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church, we'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation, never get tired, never bored, don't worry someday. There'll be no damn between us and our Lord.